So welcome everybody to the uh, um, to the second in this uh, series of webinars about the FAIR data principles, and today we're up to A for accessible. So um, last week we talked about the first one, findable, and now accessible, and next week we'll talk about interoperable, and the week after that about reusable. So um, first of all, uh, um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's Keith Russell. I'm from the Australian National Data Service. I'm your host for today. Uh, a, a big thank you to Susanna. Susanna Sabine in the background, uh, she's organising co-hosting this webinar with me. Just as a bit of background, the Australian National Data Service works with research organisations around the country to establish trusted partnerships, reliable services and to enhance capability uh, around the sector, uh, to add value to research data and to enhance the capability in the research sector. So. Um, we are working together with two other NQUIS funded projects, so that's RDS and uh, Nectar, uh, to create a, an aligned set of joint investments to deliver transformation in the research sector. There you are. So, so we have three speakers for today. Um, uh, I'll do a quick uh, kick off and just give a very brief introduction to um, uh, what the FAIR data principles say about accessible. And then um, uh, I'm uh, we're really excited and very grateful for uh, uh, two, uh, two of our speakers today, David, David Fitzgerald. Um, he, um, he is in this uh, web, webinar. He doesn't have a video uh, vid webcam, so that's why you don't see him at present. Um, uh, and David is a data manager at the Australian Longitudinal Study of Women's Health. And uh, David's going to be talking about um, uh, how, the, how in the study and how in the, the data that's been provided, uh, they make the data accessible. And I was especially interested in his perspective uh, from the, the the angle of sensitive data and making sensitive data accessible. Um, the other speaker for today is Jingbo, Jingbo Wang from uh, NCI. And uh, I've asked Jingbo to talk a bit about uh, where how NCI makes their data accessible using services over the data. So they can be interrogated and used by humans and machines. So first of all, I'd, I'd like to give a brief introduction about the um, uh, a in the in the data in the uh, fair data uh, principles, and the A stands for accessible. So the way it's been described and the way Force 11 described uh, the principles is that um, metadata, so data and the metadata, both of them, are retrieved by uh, their identifier using a standardised communications protocol. So when we talk when retrieved by their identifier, that's the identifier we talked about last week, so that can be a, a DOI, a handle, a pearl, something that's persistent, and um, that through by using the DOI, handle, or pearl, you should be able to get access to the data or the metadata, and um, the protocol uh, to get there should be open, free, and universally implementable. So the thing to think about there is that it's uh, it's something that is a protocol which is standardised and used by can be used by anybody. It's not um, uh, not something that is, is bespoke, not something that's home built or badly documented. And a classic example is just HTTP. Uh, that's you know, the very use, very normal way of using through internet uh, accessing uh, materials and accessing data. It should not require some specialised, expensive software. Another point they make in the uh, data. In the uh, in the data principles, is that the protocol should al um, should allow for an authentication and authorization procedure where necessary. So this is a common misunderstanding: is that when people read accessible, they think, oh, that means I have to make my data open. If you actually read the fair data principles, that's not what they're saying. What they're saying is um, uh, accessible does not actually have to be open or free, but it you you are expected to give exact conditions under which the data are accessible. So even heavenly protected and private data can be made fair. Um, if you implement it properly, implement the fair data principles properly, then a human being can see that the data is maybe not openly available, but then what steps they need to take to get access to the data. And because in the fair data principles, they also talk about machine access, to data. Um, if a machine goes hunting around and find, looking for the data, the machine should be able to recognize that the data is not open and what steps need to be taken to actually get to the data. I'll talk about that a little further. If the user, so that's either the human or the machine, has been granted access to the data, then uh, it should be accessible through some sort of authentication and authorization procedure, some standard procedure. The last point they make under the 
fair data principles uh, about being accessible is in the case in the uh, uh, the case in which data is no longer available at least the metadata should be accessible so this is uh, of course not ideal but in some cases it, it it is necessary to actually make, take the data down. So that could be if consent for use was only for a limited period of time, or maybe there's been a legal takedown notice, or something along those lines that really um, make it impossible to no longer make the data available. In that case, it is valuable to still keep up a metadata record describing the data and explaining that the data is no longer available. Now, just to reinforce that accessible does not always have to be open, uh, there are clear cases in which data cannot be made openly available. Obvious example is where data uh, refers to human beings and specific characteristics of those human beings like uh, information about their health, their income, religion, attitudes, political persuasion, all that sort of stuff. That's not the sort of information you can make publicly available. Um, other examples, and that's also probably worth remembering, is that there are other sets of data. So, for example, uh, um, uh, threatened species, um, the location of where threatened species uh, are um, can be data which is not something you want to make openly available because that could mean that the last few of those species are hunted down or collected. Um, famous example, the Wollemi pine, uh, is the location of that uh, uh, of those specific uh, uh, species need to be protected. So. Finally, the, um, another example where uh, data can not always be made openly available is where there are commercial interests in the data and maybe the metadata can be shared but the data itself uh, is sensitive, well, is uh, there are commercial interests around that and in that case it would not uh, be appropriate for that to be made openly available. When, you, when considering making data accessible, we do argue to make it as accessible as possible and as openly available as possible. Um, uh, possible angle there is just to provide the metadata as a starting point. If the rest cannot be made available, at least the metadata. Slightly more useful perhaps is uh, making it available through mediated access and in that case it's valuable to be clear about how the user can actually get access and that can be through um, uh, by providing an email address, name, telephone number um, and if for example the user has to go through an ethics procedure to get access to the data then clearly describe that ethics procedure and what sort of information is required to apply for that to, to apply for that ethics procedure. So I was talking about the um, mediated access oh, and about uh, providing information about who, who to contact if you want to get access to the data. Um, one thing to keep in mind there is if you are if you list a person or a, a, a person within the organization, have a think about whether that person's ever going to leave, if that's a researcher, if they're going to another organization, have a fallback, have some sort of mechanism to make sure that, uh, uh, or maybe a more general email address, so that when that data custodian leaves, somebody else can at least answer the question uh, and grant access to the data. Another possible angle in making data accessible is make, uh, creating a de-identified version of the data. Um, and making that public as long as it's properly de-identified and that can be useful for certain data users at least have a better view of what's in the data set and for some purposes a de-identified version can be enough. Finally, good point to keep in mind is if you do want to make the data accessible uh, plan for this in your consent forms because coming back afterwards and trying to get consent is not easy. Another angle worth keeping in mind and that's something I've invited uh, Jingbo to, uh, to talk about uh, more is um, making data accessible uh, can be through various routes and various protocols and uh, in some cases it doesn't make sense to have a large data set available through download. Uh, in some cases it can make much more sense to actually have services over the data which allow the users to um, interrogate parts of the data, pull in parts of the data that are much more specific and much and answer their requests. And that can be for a, a human being, but especially for a machine that can be extremely useful. So uh, one thing to keep in mind there, you need some sort of community agreed standards um, around that. But Jingbo is going to talk uh, much more about that. So that was all more from a much more a theoretical perspective. Um, I'm very grateful that uh, I have two speakers today to talk about uh, accessible in practice and how they have actually tackled making data accessible. And um, my first, the first speaker for today is David, David Fitzgerald, and he's a data manager at the Australian Longitudinal Study for Women's Health of Women's Health. And um, I was, I'm very grateful that David's available to talk uh, about what ALS 
ALSWH uh, has done to make uh, quite sensitive data still accessible for, for others to reuse. So um, David is on the line and uh, I'd like to uh, hand over to David and then um, uh, David can um, uh, David can talk about uh, how um, how the uh, how in this in the Australian longitudinal study women health women's health they have made data accessible. Thank you, Keith. Okay, so so I'm David Fitzgerald, the data manager for uh, Elsh Elsh. How do I pronounce it? That's the um, Australian longitudinal study on women's health, and I'll be talking about the accessibility issues for this. So I'm I'm going to first of all explain and give background to the our study and then talk about the um, accessibility issues and try and relate them to the um, fair data principles which um, which I've just listed here and these are the exact ones which um, Keith showed earlier so I won't go through them in detail but I'll try and relate these to our study okay so what is the um, the Elsh study it's a um, it's a collaborative effort um, or project from the two universities of um, Newcastle and Queensland and in fact, the two universities are sort of there, sort of related to um, keeping the sensitive data, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, it's one of Australia's longest running longitudinal epidemiological studies. So it's been going since 1996 and is ongoing and we, we hope to go, uh, go further into the future. It's funded by the Australian government. So we started off with over 40,000 women and a few years ago, we got a new cohort of um of seventeen thousand women, and I'll show you the four cohorts we work with. Here they are. So the four cohorts are aged based, based, and and we define them in the years of birth. So you can see there's one the, the oldest one born twenty nineteen twenty one to twenty six, and there's three other ones of various ages, and um, as you can imagine. Each cohort has their own health um, issues, and um, that's what we're interested in, and, and indeed the Australian government is interested in. So what are we collecting and our methodology? So health issues, and in particular mental, physical, reproductive, social health, there's more, um, and also life transitions, so the different ages of women, obviously going through different life transitions, life events, and things which are related to health and empl employment, Health service use, and um, and more. And I'll I'll just mention a bit of data linkage. I don't want to stress this because it's a big area with lots of issues. But we have actually linked our survey data with some administrative data sets. And in fact, they're listed there: the MBS, PBS, and cancer registries, and admitted patient hospital, and and admitted patient hospital. The, these are the, the linkage are particularly sensitive, and and we treat them quite differently in how we make the data accessible. So the data is used um, extensively and, and, and particularly more than 680 peer-reviewed papers have been published using our data and also we, um, we report back to the government frequently and national health policies have been informed by reports and use of our data. Okay, so I'll go on to the um, sort of aspects of accessibility and, and see how it relates to our data. Um, so that one there about being retrieval by an identifier using standard communications protocol. So all the data sets from our survey which are analysed and are used have a have an identifier, the same identifier and it's, I just stress here, it, it's de-identified but with a consistent new identifier and that's across all surveys. So anyone using our survey data, I'll just put the caveat, as long as it's not part of the link to data, but anyone using this our survey data has one and only one um, identifier for use. And we say this has been de-identified because it, um, there are no personal names on the data, no addresses, no postcodes, no dates of birth, although the, the year and month of birth are actually given. So obviously to do things like um, age, analysis and any the are the main ones but any other data which is deemed to be identifiable, identifiable is stripped off. The identifier is we call it the ID alias it's actually not the administrative ID which um, a respondent would see or somebody working in an office in Newcastle who's um, um, 
communicating with our respondents. They would not know what the identifier, the analyzable identifier is. They would have a different administrative ID. And just on this point, um, any small cell sizes which we think are identifiable are sort of grouped into larger groups. And for example, country of birth, we, we sort of group into broad sort of continental um, geographical areas to avoid particular countries of birth com coming up. And anyone using the data has to, well, along with a number of other um, conditions, um, they, they must not identify respondents, which although we, we go to lengths to sort of make that very difficult, it's, it's conceivable that something could come up, but they, they promise and sign that they will not identify respondents if they ever had that possibility. Okay, um, so I was also just sort of asked to sort of look at legal and eth ethical issues. So um, we, we do have a legal contract with the Australian Government Department of Health, and in fact this is ongoing, re um, and it's we 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 didn't get a 20-year one. Um, we we are regularly updated, and um, short-term contracts, and also the ethics ethics committees from the two universities there have approved our usage. And in fact, every time we do a new survey, because it's longitudinal, every, every year we're actually going back to at least one of the cohorts to survey them. Each new survey, which is not not identical to previous surveys, is subject to ethics committee. Um, oversight and approval. Yeah, so that's um, so we we do have extensive um, legal and ethical issues there. So I, I want to talk about how actually um, a an investigator or a reuser would um, would get access to our survey data. Um, so they um, and and as we explained, this is all on the website. But um, they were they must first complete an expression of interest form and. Um, in particular, they'd say who they are, why they um, are a sort of a serious researcher, what what they want to to find out from the data, and and that would be reviewed by our um, publications sub sub studies. That's the BSA committee, and uh, and um, and if and then if it is if if their EOI expression of interest is is approved. Um, they will sign confidentiality data use doc documents st statements before receiving the de de identified data, and they also must um, report back to us about their progress. And they, um, we, we expect um, some some sort of some immediate work on on the data, and uh, for them to continue with that access. But um, but if they're Expression of interest is successful. The data are actually sent to them, and um, this is this is an area where which I'm direct, directly involved in. Um, and so we we do it before sending the data encrypt it. We use seven Z seven Z software, um, and that compresses it as well. We use the AARNet cloud store system to send data to the um, approved researchers reusers and an email was sent to them as well um, with with passwords but also to establish contact um, with the, the management here with so if we, for future correspondence and I'll just put a note there about we have linked data but we, we never send this out actually and anyone using this has to actually come to our offices or, or actually there is a the Sachs Institute Shore facility which also can have it but we don't own the the linked data, and, and we've agreed not to send it anywhere. Um, so, public metadata. So, this, this refers back to the protocol being open. So, we have a website which lists the the above procedure. In fact, that I went through, but also has a lot of metadata on on it, including a data dictionary which lists all the variables and the many data sets we have. A data dictionary supplement, which is a, a description of the frequently used variables with some some detail, a data map that shows how the variables are used across the different surveys and cohorts. When I say different surveys, the longitudinal, we have up to eight surveys for, um, for some of our cohorts, and so each one is deemed a different survey and has slight differences from other surveys. We have a list of all the variables used in spreadsheets for easy access. We also have data books, which list the um, essentially the frequency summaries of the variables, the questionnaires, that, this, that the respondents filled in, 
technical reports which we produce which sort of go into detail on many of our reports and a frequently asked question page on, on exactly that. And so making metadata accessible, in fact we make data, although our data is not completely open, we, we do want to make it accessible and we do archive both the metadata and the data and we do that annually and we do it with the Australian Data Archives and although they are not releasing it yet, the, the, the plan is in the future for them to take over release of our data, perhaps when we're not doing it ourselves um, and, um, and that, that will be a role to keep our data sort of useful and used in the long term. And um, yeah, so that's what I've got to say. I'd just like to um, acknowledge um, the, 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 especially the, the women in our study who, um, who fill in the, the surveys and of course the, the Government Department of Health for funding this and the Universities of Queensland and New South Wales for um, doing the job. So thank you. That's what I have to say. Thank you, David. Thanks. Mm. Um, that's really, really interesting, uh, interesting presentation. Interesting to hear how you've made data accessible uh, in, in, in practice and what it means to make sensitive data accessible to, to researchers. Thanks, thanks for that, that perspective and thanks for that view on, on how quite sensitive data can still be made accessible through various routes. I think it's really interesting to hear that you both have the route of de-identified data through appropriate routes, but also um, uh, linked data, so much richer version, but then through um, through either Sure or through coming through the AL, ALS, w, ALS, the Australian Longitudinal Study of Women's Health. <laughs> Elch. I've got to work on that one. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, I would like to now move on to Jingbo, and uh, Jingbo's Jingbo's got a, I've asked Jingbo to talk also about making data accessible but through a very different uh, perspective and um, Jingbo works at NCI and their, um, NCI does all sorts of elements around making data findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Uh, today I've asked Jingbo to focus on the accessible side of things but I do want to note that, that NCI also does a whole bunch of other things in this space. Thank you, Keith. I think I will just turn off my camera because I can't see my presentation. <laughs> um, right, so my name is Jingbo Wang. I work at National Computational Infrastructure, which is a computer supercomputer center located in Australian National University campus. So today I'm going to address um, different flavor of data accessibility. Uh, practice at NCI and um, before I go for that I just wanted to make a comment that FAIR principle is quite useful um, to govern our data management practice and uh, we use it um, a lot in every single aspect in our data management. So this is a quick overview of the data sets we have. So as, um, as you can see I've listed here the main data type that we um, um, store at NCI are national collections about climate models, satellite images, bathymetry, elevation, hydrology, geophysics, and those data are quite geospatial focused. But we also have other social science data and genomic sequencing data and astronomy data. So we aim to provide a user with data as a service. As many digital repository will do, uh, in our data management, we catalog data so that people can query the metadata database to find what we have here. We also publish data through various data services. That's a focus I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. We offer data quality assurance, data quality control, and benchmarking use cases. We provide data through virtual laboratories. We also provide help on data visualization. If I wanted to uh, make something uh, that we are different from other digital repository is because we co-located with HPC facility high performance computing. Given the nature of our large scale of the data, we host more than 10 petabyte research data. So we really want to make good use of the high performance computing here to, um, to advance science research. So this is the six top points that I wanted to address today about data access. So I put the red 
uh, color words to show the difference for each point. So initially I will talk about the how do we control the data access and then I'm going to present uh, one example of how do we use persistent identifier to manage data access. Then I will talk about two main data services that we offer at NCI for our users. One is the threads, one, the other one is a G-Ski, which is a more uh, fancy and scalable distributed data server. Uh, finally, I'm going to cover very quickly about the data versioning and the quality of the data. So the first point is about how do we control the data access. Most of our data are coming from our stakeholders such as Geoscience Australia, the Bureau of Metrology, CSRO, uh, universities, and many data has been funded by Australian government, so it naturally fall into CC BY 4 license. Some owners also impose that this data should be non-commercial, non-derivative, or share alike type of CC BY. We also have international partners, such as in the European and US, and they impose um, uh, even strict term and conditions if people wanted to access the data. So this is the legal perspective about how do we control the license, the data access through licenses. On the file system, we actually hard-coded the data access control using ECHOs. So this is a way how do we separate different group of people access the same same data. So we have basically for each collection, we have two access group. The first group is has the read and write permission, which means those are data managers who are is able to generate data and write data and modify data. The second group is a read only group. So for those people who are in the read only group, they can access the data on the file system, but they can't really modify anything. This way, we actually protect the integrity of the data. We only give access to authorized person who really can manage the data. So there is also a social aspect of, of data access. Um, um, for a research project, we often see the embargo period that um, maybe after two years of the project, the data can be made available. Also, some researchers say, I want to share my data after my journal article uh, about this data set is published. So um, another example is from the Bureau of Meteorology. We have a data that there is a six months time delay between the data is being developed, verified, until it is being operational available on our thread server. So. The second point I wanted to raise is um, our practice about implementing a persistent identifier. Often we experience some uh, frustration about when we give people the URL to access the data, it's only valid for a certain period of time or only valid during the time that somebody can maintain it. Afterwards, we can't really guarantee and also the URL, the original URL, if you look at it on the left-hand side of the slides, those are the metadata catalog URL or service endpoint URL. Let, let's um, look at the second one, which is service endpoint. So from this URL name convention, you can tell the later part, which include the project code, file pass, file name. Anything in this pass, for example, project code changed, of you, you rename the file or we shuffle the file around and this link will be broken. So the original URL that we provided here is not a very stable one. We adopt the product that CSRO developed some time ago about persistent identifier as a broker. So we now, most of the time, we give the external user the right hand side uh, the name convention. As you can see, we have four main categories after PID.nci.org.eu. Now we have data set, we have services, we have documentation, and we have vocabularies. The only thing keep it unique is the file identifier or UUID. It's, it's basically as long as the identifier keeps the same, the URL on the right hand side is pretty consistent. 
if anything changed in the original URL on the left hand side, what we need to do is update the mapping inside of the PID services broker without interrupting the URL that we give to the external user. We have the technical implementation published in the Digital Science Journal, so you're welcome to have a look. Um, now I'm going to talk about the main data services that um, Keith really wanted me to address um, from NCS pers perspective. So I divided our the type of data service into two main groups. One is the OGC services. I'm going to talk about more about what is OGC in a second. The other type of data services is more project step specific, such as we are one of the largest node in, Aust uh, in Southern Hemisphere as part of the Earth System Federation grid, which is the aggregation of climate model from Global Research Institute. So the way we provide data services is we copy the main uh, of the data model to serve for Australian users. Another fancy data service that I'm going to show you a bit more is called GISKI. It's a scalable data server that um, directly interact with our file system. So what is OGC? OGC is Open Geospatial Consortium. It is an international non-profit organization to make quality open standards for global geospatial community. We find OGC standards quite useful for us because we have a lot of geospatial featured data and OGC have all sorts of standards for different type of mapping, feature, coverage, processing for us to use because it's so common and it's free for people to use and if we made the data available through OGC standards, a lot of people naturally can access our data. So that's the motivation. So what is the OGC services? It's actually an API uh, in, in the middle between the data store and the user. So the user can request whatever available on OGC services. Let's say I want a map about the anomaly uh, across whole Australian continental. And NCI hosts this data, but we, we host the data, we don't host images. What the LGC web services is do is he actually extracts the image and returns back to the user. And user can take the URL which contain the image of the data put on their own uh, web portal. For example, you can get the URL and copy and paste onto the national map to show the grades. So NCI has two main production data type service. One is the threads. So you can often find the threads available on our data catalog. This is the interface of the geo network. So the red circled link is the um, NCI thread server. So you can open and click it. The second interface is a data catalog. They more or less contain the same information, but serving for different purposes. Geo network is mainly for data harvester, for machine accessible. The data catalog is for human readable. So threads, in a short, uh, in a very simple term, is it's a data services which allow you to browse and access the data. So I've listed here six main type of services that Threads offer. The very first two, OpenDAP and NetCDF, is subset, subsetting the data. So we have a lot of very large data, but in practice, when scientists access the data, they don't necessarily have to access all the data. They might just need a very small piece of data from this big pool. So what the Threads can offer is, you can actually define your query and only get the data, the part that you want. So it really saves a lot of traffic on the internet. And this, the other two standard OGC web mapping services, web coverage services, is very popular for people to access the mapping and the coverage directly out of our data. And of course, threads offer a very quick data viewer. If you don't know what this data is, you can have a quick look of what it is on the web without downloading it. it of course, the also threads offer the direct download if you really want to download the data. Another fancy scalable distributed data server that I was talking about is called GISKI. GISKI is the in-house NCI developed product. 
um, what it does is we have a lot of data on a file system, millions, millions of files on a system. If we wanted to people to query this data, how? It's going to be very hard to create millions of metadata records for every single file. So what we've done is we use the crawler to crawl the file system, get the header of the file, and formulate as a database, metadata database. And then the database will be a query window for people to hand in the request. Say, give me a um, poly, uh, give me some images in the polygon at what at some time. So the um, so the metadata database actually includes those essential geospatial information and it returned back to you the user of what they requested. So we published recently a technical details of um, GSKI implementation. You're more than welcome to have a look. La, um, um, the Jing, last Jingbo? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Jingbo, I, I think you're getting close to the end. I just wanted to uh, ask you, there was only, only about a minute or two left, so if you could uh, sure. work towards I'll the end. I'll quickly go through. Yes, yeah, so the last two points will be version data. Um, again, because of the scale of the data, we can't really um, store every single step of the data. So what we can do is we stop the raw data and the final version and we keep the URI of the metadata in the middle step. So in that way, the provenance information was kept and also saved the storage. The last point of the quality data is I would um, think somewhat, some users say we can't really assume we can access data and the data is flawless. So by publishing data aside with the quality report, we wanted to provide data access with a certain type of assurance. So we also have the publication that is in, going to be in place very soon. Thank you for your attention. Uh, that's our experiences so far about data access. Thanks, thanks, Jingbo. Uh, that was that was really very well a, a very quick overview of of all the all the work you've been doing there around services and all the work you've been doing there about making data accessible and not only for humans but also for machines. Uh, so uh, first of all, I would like to thank thank David and Jingbo again for providing a sort of an insight into what it means in practice in making data accessible from different perspectives. Uh, so that was the very interesting presentations. Um, in case you are interested in learning more about making your data accessible and things you can think about there, um, this slide provides you some resources. Uh, the Med.data project's got a number of materials around sensitive data. Um, oh, there's a link here to the Australian uh, Australian da Data Archive and uh, the access conditions there. Um, on the ANS website, we have some materials on sensitive data. Um, Another piece of work we're doing uh, together with the community is looking at data services. So this is the work that uh, Jingbo also talked about and uh, making sure that the services over the data are discoverable. And uh, there is an interest group working in this space. So if you're interested in learning more about it and in also engaging more around that, uh, please follow the link and uh, there's more information there about that data services interest group. Last year we also did a 23 things, research data things, and two of the, the research data things are relevant to the topics discussed today. So have a look at those thing 10 and thing 19 if you want to learn more and also want to uh, get, get your hands dirty and try out a bit, a little bit what it, what it means to make data accessible. Uh, the link at the bottom is just the general link about the fair data principles on the ANS website. So this week we talked about accessible, next week we're going to be talking about interoperable. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Oh, finally, I would like to acknowledge and uh, thank, or well, first of all, our speakers for today, and but I would also like to thank NCRIS, so the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy Program for funding ANS and making this all possible. Thank you all for your time and look forward to seeing you next week.